I don't know exactly when people started creating images on various objects, but I suppose since the first person drew the first picture on the wall of their cave, we haven't stopped dreaming of making drawn images as realistic as possible. One of the key problems here was that the images depicted on a flat surface, or any other surface, were also flat. They did not contain information about volume, or more precisely, about the position of objects in the third dimension perpendicular to the plane of the canvas, or whatever replaced it. Over time, artists devised a number of tricks, such as perspective and manipulation of light and shadow, to give flat images the illusion of volume. Subsequently, with the invention of cameras, we gained the ability to simply copy this information from the surrounding world, resulting in images that were much more realistic. However, this still wasn't enough. Yes, the most sophisticated paintings and photographs provide an impression of volume, but the image still remains flat. You cannot view the image from another angle. The foreground and background are rigidly attached to each other and do not shift when the observer moves. Photography remains just an image, a set of points of various colors and brightness, a projection onto a plane of how a particular scene appeared from a particular angle. Today, by applying the same laws of perspective, we have learned to create images that sometimes look frighteningly realistic and three-dimensional, though the effect is visible only when viewed from a certain angle. Shift slightly to the side, and the image turns into who knows what. However, people did not lose hope of eventually learning to create truly three-dimensional images that look equally realistic from any angle. As of today, it cannot yet be said that this problem has truly been solved. But at the moment, through modern technologies, we are very close to solving it from several different directions. The first technology, or rather technological trick, which is relevant to mention in this context, was called Pepper's Ghost, named after the English inventor John Pepper. Pepper devised a simple and elegant way to create an impressive special effect. Semi-transparent, flickering figures representing ghosts would simply appear in the air in front of the audience. The technology was first used in 1862 during a play based on Charles Dickens' story, The Haunted Man. The spectacle impressed the audience so much that people rushed to the play just to see it. Perhaps this was one of the first examples of how special effects, rather than acting or the script, ensured the success of a theatrical production. Pepper's Ghost is a simple and elegant optical trick, demonstrating how much can be achieved even with the simplest techniques, given a developed imagination. Its essence is as follows. A semi-transparent mirror was installed between the audience and the stage. In the simplest case, just a sheet of glass tilted at a certain angle. The actor playing the ghost would be below the stage and invisible to the audience. They would be illuminated by a bright light source and their image would be projected onto the glass screen, thus becoming visible. And when it was time for the ghost to leave the stage, the light would simply be turned off and the ghost would disappear. Thanks to the angle of inclination, the glass remained invisible to the audience as their own reflections in it were not visible to them. Today, this effect is used in some museums, for example, in the Buckingham Palace Museum. There, however, instead of live actors, a video recorded image is used, transmitted from a screen hidden from the viewers on the ceiling. The Pepper's Ghost technology allows for effectively incorporating an image into the environment, creating a fairly realistic illusion that something is in the room that isn't actually there. However, the image still remains flat, a major breakthrough in the field of creating volumetric images occurred in the early 20th century when stereovision was invented, a way to create the illusion of three-dimensionality in an image for a viewer who observes it through special stereo glasses. Yes, the effect that allows for the creation of amazing modern 3D movies was invented over a hundred years ago, and the first full-length feature film using stereo effects, The Power of Love, was shown in the USA in 1922. The stereo effect is also a type of optical illusion in the sense that it utilizes the properties of our vision and the brain's processing of signals received from our eyes. When we look at a real object, our eyes see it at slightly different angles. Essentially, when we look at an object, we see two slightly different images of it with our eyes, 
and our brain combines these images into one, using the information about the difference in angles at which the object is seen by each eye to estimate the distance to the object. The closer the object, the greater the difference in angles, and thus the smaller the visible difference in angles, the farther away the observed object is. Now let's consider two identical objects placed at the same distance from us, but slightly offset from each other, say drawn on a sheet of paper. Each of our eyes will see both images and nothing interesting will happen. The brain will simply merge both pictures as it is accustomed to do. But what if we somehow make the right eye see only one of the two images and the left eye see only the other one? The brain will receive information about the presence of two almost identical images at slightly different angles, which is what constantly happens with it. And the brain will process this information just as it always does. It will merge both images, showing us one object and interprets the difference in angles as the distance to this object. And if we now change the relative positions of the objects, we can deceive the brain. By bringing the objects closer together so that the difference in angles at which our eyes see them decreases, we create the illusion of the object moving away. And by moving them apart, increasing the difference in angles, we create the illusion of the object approaching. By placing pairs of images of different objects, each slightly offset from the other, on our drawing, we can create the illusion that one of them is depicted further away than the other, even though both images are actually at the same distance from us as they are depicted on the surface of the same piece of paper or screen. All that remains is to figure out how to make different eyes see different images. This is where stereo glasses come to the rescue. Initially, the images of a stereo pair were made in different colors and filters of different colors were placed on the lenses of the glasses so that, for example, our right eye would see only the blue part of the stereo pair, and the left eye would see only the red part. Today, 3D glasses with polarization filters are more commonly used, whose lenses only allow light with a certain polarization to pass through. This technology indeed allows for conveying depth of perspective, but it is still not true three-dimensional imagery. For example, you cannot view the scene from different angles, discovering new details that were previously unseen by you. But science has not stood still either. The next major breakthrough in creating three-dimensional images occurred in the mid-20th century with the invention of holograms, images so close to three-dimensional as possible for something applied to a flat surface. Holograms not only provide the perception of depth, but also allow the image to be viewed from slightly different angles. And they also have several other remarkable features, which we will discuss a little later in this video. But first, let's say a few words about what holograms are and how they are created. When creating a photograph, we capture ordinary light reflected from the photographed object and reaching the detector, whether it's photographic film or the light-sensitive matrix of a digital camera. Then, the resulting image is viewed in ordinary visible light, either reflected from photo paper or emitted by the display screen in accordance with the instructions given to it. Unlike photography, holography uses laser light, which has a number of important features. The main one for us in this case is its property of coherence. Any light ray is a set of electromagnetic waves, oscillations of the intensity of the electromagnetic field propagating in space. That is, in the region of propagation of the electromagnetic wave, the value of the intensity of the electromagnetic field cyclically passes through many values. First, it is zero, then it increases, reaching a maximum, then begins to decrease, again reaching zero and transitioning into the region of negative values, reaching a minimum, and then starts to increase again, reaching zero, after which the process repeats again. Mathematically, this is described by this equation. This thing here, determining the maximum and minimum values of the field intensity, is called the amplitude. And what is in parentheses under the sine sign, and essentially determines the specific value of the field intensity at a given point in space at a given moment in time, is called the phase. So here's the thing. Even if we consider waves of the same frequency and wavelength in ordinary visible light, it turns out that there will be waves with different phases in the light beam. Laser light, however, is different. Not only is it monochromatic, meaning it consists of waves of a single wavelength, 
but also the phases of its constituent waves are identical. This is known as coherence. To study the propagation of such light in space, it is convenient to introduce the concept of a wave front, a line connecting points in a medium where the wave is in phase. Let's take a laser beam and split it into two. This can be achieved, for example, using a special device called a beam splitter. We'll allow the first beam, which we'll call the reference beam, to propagate straight ahead and will reflect the second beam using a mirror so that it deviates from its original direction and intersects the first beam. In the region of intersection, we will have a kind of sum of two beams, but not a simple sum, rather a vector sum, or more precisely, a wave sum. At some points, the beams will converge in phase, reinforcing each other, resulting in bright bands whose brightness exceeds that of the original beam, while at other points, they will combine out of phase, canceling each other out. This phenomenon is called interference. If we now place some object, let's say an opaque plate, in the light beam, we'll see on it a specific pattern of alternating light and dark bands. This is called an interference pattern. Now let's suppose that instead of a regular plate, we have a material capable of changing its properties under the influence of electromagnetic radiation. Let's say that where the light intensity is high, the material darkens, and where it is low, it remains transparent. If we place this material in our light beam, the interference pattern will be imprinted on the plate as alternating light and dark bands. By properly adjusting the parameters of our setup, we can make the width of the bands and the distance between them comparable to the wavelength of the incident light. As a result, we obtain a so-called diffraction grating, possessing an interesting feature. The light falling on it will seem to split into several beams traveling at different angles. This angle depends, among other things, on the wavelength of the incident light, and therefore diffraction gratings are capable of separating white light beams, consisting of waves of different lengths, into different components. Everyone is familiar with this effect. If they have ever held a compact disc in their hands, the surface of which is covered with tiny grooves, and thus represents a diffraction grating. In our case, the light is monochromatic, and when it falls on the diffraction grating, it simply deflects at certain angles. Now here's the thing. If we use our photographic plate with the interference pattern captured on it as a diffraction grating, and then illuminate this grating with the same beam as our reference beam, then after passing through the grating, this beam will deviate from its propagation direction. And the coolest thing is that it will deviate at exactly the same angle as the reflected beam through which we form the interference pattern. That is, our diffraction grating, made from a photographic plate, somehow retains information about the second beam. Essentially, in the same way that a photographic plate retains information about the light that has passed through it, but better because if a photographic plate only stores information about the intensity of the light falling on each of its points, then our plate also retains information about its phase. Let's slightly modify our setup by placing a lens in the path of the second beam, which will focus its light onto the mirror. As a result, on the mirror, we'll get a bright glowing spot emitting a diverging light flux. The interference pattern that arises at the intersection of the two beams will change the interference bands will bend, turning into arcs of concentric circles. The way the reference beam passes through such a plate will also change. We'll get a beam converging to a point, or more precisely, to an image of the point formed on our mirror. So, our diffraction photographic plate again retains information about the structure of the second beam, also called the object beam, including information that it originated from a point and this information can be reproduced by illuminating it with an exact copy of the reference beam, even if it's a completely different beam, and we'll do it in a completely different laboratory. And it won't just be a photograph of the point on the mirror, it will be its hologram, containing information not only about the intensity of the light, but also about the phase, meaning it contains complete information about the object beam or more precisely, about the transformations it underwent in our setup. And if we split the object beam in half more, causing it to reflect off two mirrors and creating images of two points, it will be a true volumetric image of these points. We'll perceive the difference in distances between the points, that is, the depth of the image, 
and we'll also see the movement of parts of the image relative to each other if we move relative to them. Now, instead of a mirror, let's place a more complex shaped object in the path of the object beam. All visible objects reflect light to some extent, to a greater or lesser degree, and our object will also reflect the laser object beam introducing distortions into it during the reflection process. These distortions will affect the structure of the wavefront and the interference pattern. And thanks to this, they will be recorded on the photographic plate. The photographic plate itself will not contain a complete image of the object in the full sense of the word. To the eye, it will simply appear dark, and only upon magnification will we see a complex structure of alternating and intersecting interference fringes at various angles. But once illuminated by a laser identical to the reference beam, under a certain angle, we will see an image of the distorted object beam. Moreover, it will be a true 3D image, conveying perspective, which can also be viewed from slightly different angles, essentially an almost perfect 3D image. Subsequently, the technology was improved. Instead of using two beams, only one was employed. The beam passed through the plate, reflected off the holographed object, and then reflected back. The interference between the direct and reflected beams inside the plate essentially formed a diffraction grating, just like in the first case. However, with this approach, holograms could be created using multiple laser beams of different colors, making the image colorful. Additionally, such holograms could be visible not only in laser light, but also in ordinary light. In a photograph, each point on the surface carries information about just one point of the depicted object. Cut out a piece of the photograph, and the data about what was depicted in that piece will be lost. In a holographic plate, the information about each point of the image is distributed across the entire surface of the plate, and vice versa. Each portion of the plate contains information about the entire hologram in miniature. Cut out a piece of the holographic plate, and you can still view the corresponding part of the image from a different angle, as if looking at it through a window, a small portion of which is covered or painted over. This makes holographic images more integral, and this property of holograms found a somewhat unexpected application, which we'll discuss a bit later in this same video. Holograms indeed represent real three-dimensional images of objects. However, they are not perfect. The main problem was associated with recording or, as it's also called, registering holograms. The fact that you're preserving a full 3D image of an object means you need significantly higher data recording density. If a regular photographic film has a resolution of several hundred lines per millimeter of surface, then for good holographic results, you need several thousand such lines. Otherwise, some information will be lost, and the image will be unclear, blurry, and generally of poor quality. Materials capable of achieving such resolution do exist, but they have relatively poor photosensitivity. In simple terms, you need to provide them with more light energy to burn the diffraction grating of the hologram into them. For a laser of the same power, this would mean an increase in exposure time, meaning the time when the object being holographed is inside the setup. Moreover, throughout this time, the object must remain completely still. Otherwise, the image once again would become blurry. And of course, this becomes a serious obstacle to creating moving holograms for which we would need to obtain a series of holograms of the same object within very short intervals of time. Of course, one could use short high-power laser pulses for hologram registration. In our previous videos, we've already discussed how today we can generate pulses lasting 10 to the 15 seconds, or even 10 18 seconds, the power of which in modern super powerful lasers can reach 10 to 15 watts. However, such lasers are, of course, expensive, and they have more useful applications than creating, albeit impressive, but still practically useless images from a practical standpoint. Well, not entirely true. Holograms have found practical applications and in several areas at once. In particular, people quite quickly figured out how to use holograms as a means of protecting various images from being copied, such as banknotes. Indeed, you can't just copy a hologram. Well, you can but the resulting image won't be three-dimensional. It'll be a regular picture, and no one will mistake it for the original. To create an accurate copy of a hologram, you either need to go through the holography process with an exact copy of the initial object, 
and an exact copy of the holographic setup, or you need to accurately replicate the line pattern of the diffraction grating on the surface of the hologram, which is a very non-trivial task, partly due to the very complex structure of this grating and its microscopic scales. However, today, in the era of digital technologies, there exists another way to create holograms. Indeed, theoretically, we can calculate the diffraction grating needed to produce the desired image at the output. In other words, we can dispense with the labor-intensive and resource-intensive process of hologram registration. You feed the computer ordinary flat photos of the object from different perspectives. It analyzes them, creates a three-dimensional digital model of the object, and then calculates the diffraction grating needed to obtain its precise three-dimensional holographic image. The idea seems obvious, but for a long time, implementing it was challenging because such calculations require colossal computational resources. Today, this is achieved using neural networks. The company Looking Glass Portrait offers something like holographic frames for photos. Only in such a frame, you're shown not a photograph, but a full-fledged three-dimensional holographic image created based on user-uploaded data. Moreover, this image can be animated as a short looping clip. However, the prices are steep. A holographic photo frame of standard size at the time of publishing this video will cost $300. Nevertheless, the important fact is, it's possible. And from here, it's not far to the next step. Interactive holograms that you can interact with, such as rotating objects, moving them, or affecting them in other ways. The question is only about the computational power required for this. However, in reality, this power turns out to be quite significant, and the capabilities of holograms, despite all their advantages, are limited. They are visible only within a relatively narrow range of viewing angles. And you cannot, for example, walk around the hologram in a circle and see what's behind it. Fortunately, there are alternative approaches to solving the problem. The three-dimensional images produced using these technologies are also usually called holograms. Although strictly speaking, this is incorrect because an entirely different approach is used to create them, creating so-called volumetric displays. For example, they are created using so-called holographic fans. I think you may have seen one of these devices somewhere in shopping centers or similar places. The principle here is quite simple. Essentially, it's the same LED display but unlike a regular display, the glowing pixels are arranged on blades. When the blades rotate rapidly, they become invisible and the image appears to be suspended in the air. It looks quite impressive even in the simplest cases, and the most complex systems of this kind today can create an image whose quality almost matches that of images on regular monitors. However, it's just a flat image, albeit on an invisible screen, although you can give it the appearance of three-dimensionality through standard perspective and shading tricks. However, you could go another way, for example, by installing several fans one after another. Thus emerged the so-called rotating volumetric displays. And with their help, you can create truly volumetric images with real depth. A similar method is used in the volumetric displays from the company Voxon Photonics. However, instead of creating the image using LEDs on moving blades, it's projected onto many rapidly vibrating flat screens. You can even control such images using special controllers. The main thing is not to accidentally touch the rapidly rotating parts of the volumetric display. To avoid this undesirable development of events, rotating volumetric displays are often enclosed in a cubic or hemispherical transparent shell. Researchers at Brigham Young University have gone even further along the same path. In their setup, images are drawn directly in the air by quickly moving tiny scattering light particles, essentially specks of dust. The particles are moved using optical tweezers, a technology that allows dragging tiny objects using laser beams specially focused in a certain way. More detailed information on how this works was discussed in one of our previous videos. In this case, ultraviolet rays invisible to the eye are used, after which the captured particle is illuminated with visible light, creating a glowing point. If you move the glowing particle rapidly with reflected light, the observer's eye will not notice its individual positions, just as it does not notice the rotating blades of a holographic fan, and will see the entire trajectory simultaneously. 
Thus, you can draw small objects in space. So far, we're only talking about truly tiny drawings measuring just a few centimeters, but in theory, we can use many such particles and draw more complex dynamic pictures. In simpler terms, it's essentially the same volumetric display, but instead of a display, there are particles held in place by laser beams. Most researchers working towards creating real 3D images for various purposes today are focused on developing volumetric displays of one construction or another. And although the images obtained with their help are also commonly referred to as holograms, they are essentially no longer holograms. However, genuine holograms also interest modern scientists and engineers, albeit mostly for slightly different purposes. For example, at Microsoft, there is a project called Silica, aimed at creating high capacity and reliable data storage media for long-term storage. The basis of such media is glass plates inside which, using the same lasers, a diffraction grating of a special structure is burned, consisting not of stripes, but of individual points, so-called voxels. When this volumetric diffraction grating is illuminated, a holographic image appears, which can be deciphered into familiar binary data according to a certain algorithm. It's somewhat similar to how compact disks were structured, but it's not just an image. It's a holographic image that can be viewed from different angles, providing different data. This allows for significantly higher data recording density, and most importantly, guarantees their integrity. Just as you can still see an image on a hologram, even if part of the plate is damaged, in this case, the overall picture of the recorded data can be reconstructed even if some voxels are lost. Developers claim that glass media can ensure data integrity for tens of thousands of years, which is unattainable for other types of media. That's how science works sometimes. While developing a way to create cool volumetric images, a technology was invented that could later be applied to the field of reliable storage of large volumetric data. Similarly, when Archimedes discovered his law regarding the buoyant force acting on a body submerged in a fluid or gas, he probably couldn't imagine that centuries later, this law would help people take to the skies for the first time in a hot air balloon. The paths of scientific development are unpredictable, and no one knows what practical application various research will find many years later. It can be confidently said, however, that seemingly useless scientific knowledge doesn't exist in principle. That's why on our channel, we will continue to explore the most interesting and potentially significant scientific achievements in the field of physics. Although we can never be sure that some technology we may overlook, possibly known today, won't become the very thing that fundamentally changes the world tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, or a hundred years from now.